I realize it's been a little while since my last video and this is why. I'm going to explain that in a little bit. Let me show you what happened. So as you can see here, my leg is uh, completely wrapped. Uh, there's no cast on here, but it was broken. That's made it a little bit uh, hard to get around, and of course it's uh, hard to use the milling machine and some of the other machines. Uh, it's been getting a lot better, so it's uh, easier to move around, but I still have to move around on crutches. Now, there is one aspect of this that I think uh, may be of interest to machinists out there. Fun fact, turns out surgeons use reamers. I'll leave it at that, because I know some of you probably don't want to hear the details. Let me show you the other thing that's new. So I got this box from uh, China. Uh, let's see what's inside. This is for the uh, injection molding project. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned is that uh, I wanted to be able to uh, color the plastic. And I also want to be able to uh, make sure that the plastic is uh, anti-static. So this should be the master batch that I ordered. And uh, master batch is uh, essentially stock material that you put in along with the plastic and mix it in. And look at this. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Master batch. Green. Perfect. And let's see what else is in here. Master batch. Black. Cool. So this should be enough to make uh, quite a few thousand uh, copies of the, the parts that I want to make. So let me uh, explain a little bit more about Master Batch. Um, I have a small amount of uh, ABS pellets here and the Master Batch. The question is, what ratio do you use when you mix them together? And the answer is on here. Let's see if I can get this to focus. You can see it says dosage ratio, and it says 4%. That tells me that I have to mix 4% of the master batch uh, into the, the blend of ABS, rounding it up to 5%. That means it's about a 20 to 1 ratio between the master batch and the ABS. So it doesn't take a lot of master batch to be able to color the ABS. Now, the other thing that um, I don't think I mentioned but is on here is that this also says anti-static. So not only am I going to get the color, I'm also going to get the anti-static properties. Now there's another thing that's interesting about this, which has to do with my machines. Now the way my injection molding machines are set up is there is a, uh, a cylinder, which is the, what applies the pressure, and then there's another cylinder uh, which is hollow, and that is the, the heating chamber. The heating chamber is where we have the heating barrel that heats up the plastic. And then the, the plunger is what pushes on that plastic and causes the plastic to come out through the nozzle at the bottom of the injection molding machine. What this means is that there isn't a lot of space. I mean, the, the heating barrel is you know, about this tall. So there isn't a lot of space for the plastic to mix with the master batch, which means probably it's not going to mix very well. So how does that work in the big machines? The big machines have an auger. So what happens in the case of the big machines is the plastic comes in and then it's picked up by an auger. The auger twists around and pulls the plastic to one side. Now as it moves toward the injection uh, nozzle, the pitch of the auger also decreases. I'm not sure that's the right word. Anyway, the, the screws get closer together. So it's also compressing the plastic to increase the pressure and to increase the temperature. So the auger does two things. One is it causes shear in the plastic, uh, and the shear helps mix up the plastic. And then the other thing, of course, I mentioned is it adds some pressure and some temperature. So how do we do that for my machine? Well, some number of years ago, uh, when I was fairly new to 3D printing, there was a Kickstarter project called the Philistruder. The purpose of the Philistruder, and it still exists, is to take 
uh, raw pellets of plastic like this. This is from the Philostrator kit, along with the colorants, and turn them into rolls of filament, kind of like this, uh, although this one's almost empty. Now, when I bought the machine, it came with a 3 millimeter nozzle. I've since switched to 1.75 millimeter diameter filament, so it, it wasn't really something I wanted. Plus, I decided I didn't want to spend a lot of try time trying to get the diameter perfect. As a result, I've never built it. But, turns out, it should do a very good job of making pellets with the master batch that I have and the raw ABS. So let me explain how that works. First of all, uh, they have an auger. So here's the auger that comes with the kit. Now this auger is a constant pitch, but that's okay because we care about the shearing to get things to mix together. The second thing that it has, oh, and let me explain how that works. So that auger is going to go through uh, this tube here, which is cast iron, I believe and needs to be cleaned up so it doesn't go in right now. But the idea is it'll fit in here. The plastic will come down here and then work its way toward the nozzle. And the nozzle looks like this. Let me get closer. You can see it, it has a, um, a hole in it, and that's a three millimeter diameter hole. So my goal is to uh, build the filistruder and have it uh, start to extrude the filament. And then while the filament is still soft, to have you know, some type of scissor action or, or an arm that comes around and chops off the filament into pellets. And then I can use that directly in my injection molding machine. And I don't have to worry about mixing in the injection molding machine. That's the plan. Uh, I've started the project uh, by printing some of the pieces. So here's the, the hopper. Plastic will come in through here into that hole in the, uh, the iron pipe and then go this way. And then the other thing that I've 3D printed is a case for the electronics. The electronics in this case, it's, it's just a PID controller to keep the temperature of the apparel um, at the right temperature. So anyway, that's the plan. Uh, if all goes well, then I'll be able to make the exact type of pellets that I want and the exact color I want, which is really cool. The other thing is, uh, with this downtime, I've been doing some thinking. So I mentioned that uh, you know th these are the, uh, the parts that I made before. And this is uh, where I was trying to inject from one side uh, based on the advice. And the problem I'm running into is I just don't have enough uh, clamping force to be able to well, a combination clamping force and injection pressure to get things from one side to the other. I may have enough injection pressure, but I don't have enough clamping force. If you look right here, uh, let me get close and see if I can get it to focus. Okay, so right here is something called flash. And uh, flash happens when uh, the two halves of the bolts start to separate. Uh, just a tiny bit more flash than this results in the mold halves coming apart in a real mess. And that means that I don't have enough clamping force. So four and a half tons, which is what I have on my machine, isn't enough. Now, when I was feeding to, to, from two points, I was able to make parts just barely. So a couple things have happened. Uh, first is that um, I found a used Morgan press. And the Morgan press has a clamping force of 20 tons. So that's f about four times my tra the clamping force I have on my Traven. 40, 20 tons is more than enough to be able to make these parts. So that's really cool. Uh, it also has a little bit higher injection pressure, and it has a heater plate. Now, the heater plate is useful because it will help keep the mold temperature up to about 120 degrees for uh, polystyrene, and I think it's about 180 degrees for ABS. I have to look it up. That will keep the, the plastic warmer so that it can flow a farther, uh, you know, further, farther distance before it starts to cool and solidify, which makes it easier to fill large molds. So I was going to go down and pick up that machine 
And I had the flight set up and everything else. And then I broke my leg playing soccer, by the way. Um, and yes, we lost, unfortunately. And so I had to uh, cancel that uh, flight. Um, the airline was great about it, but I don't recommend that as a way to cancel and get a refund on your flight. Uh, fortunately, the guy who has the machine is willing to wait. Thank you very much. And uh, it's going to be probably about five or six weeks before I can go down and uh, arrange to get the machines. Now, because of that delay, uh, there are also issues that I've been running into with my TAG, CNC mill. One of them, uh, which I mentioned before, is that, let me see if I can uh, show this to you. See if I can get it to focus. So it's not really visible, but this small hole near the center is not completely round. It's actually pretty good, but uh, it's not completely round because of the backlash on my TAG CNC mill. Now, the thing about backlash is, all right, you're moving the, the carriage back and forth, and you have a screw that you're turning to move it. So the idea is you move it this way, and then when you reverse the screw, you want it to immediately start moving this way. Now, with backlash, what happens is, you know, when you reverse the screw, you have to reverse it some distance before it re-engages, and then the carriage starts to move again. Now, if that's the way things behave, everything is good because Mach 3 has this nice uh, backlash compensation. Now, when I turned on the backlash compensation, what happened is really interesting. I got a completely different shape of hole, and the holes were actually smaller than they should be, which I thought was really odd. So I did some measurements, and what I discovered is that uh, when it moved this way, and then I turned it this way, it moved a few thousandths of an inch, and then stopped while the screw continued to turn, and then started to move again. Now, that is not a behavior that Mach 3 can handle. So I ended up turning it off the, off the, back, the backlash compensation. The other thing is, uh, you know, the Morgan Press can handle larger molds, uh, 8 by 8 inch molds. And with my tag, I'm really limited in the Y travel. The maximum you can get is five and a half inches with my uh, with my vice in there. I'm limited to about three inches. So I've decided to take the plunge and get a Tormach PNC 770. I've debated between the 770 and the 1100. They're both really nice machines. The main difference between the 770 and the 1100 from my point of view is that the 770 has a 10,000 RPM spindle versus 5100, I think it is, for the 1100. And with dealing with micro-machining, in other words, tools smaller than 1 8 inch diameter, it's really nice for, to have the higher spindle speed. So my thinking is I'll go with the 70, 770. Now, because of the delay with uh, my leg, it means that I can uh, uh, order the 770 and get the new milling machine, learn how to make molds for it, and then get back on track and have no problems at all making the parts. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, that's why I'm working on the, the, Phyllis, the Phyllis Struder pedal maker right now. And hopefully in the next episode, maybe in a week or so, I'll be able to show you the progress that I have on the Phyllis Struder. I also have some other projects I'll probably get prepped uh, and get set up for the mold making phase, and so I'll go into those as well. Thanks again, and see you next time. Mm -hmm.